might be coming in in a bit and we've got a number of people online so if anyone online has any questions feel free to just type it in the chat box and i can read them out loud uh welcome to the nuclear science and security consortium today we have dr nicholas Stelzo. he is currently a deputy group leader for the nuclear particle physics group within the nuclear chemical and science division at livermore he earned a ba in chemistry and physics from Harvard University in 1997 and a PhD in physics from the University of California at Berkeley in 2003. He arrived at Livermore in 2006 as a Lawrence Fellow after spending two years at Argonne National Laboratory developing novel techniques to test the standard model of particle physics using short-lived radioactive nuclei. At Livermore, he has established a multifaceted beta decay spectroscopy program. And that's what we'll be talking about today, I believe. Yep, that's right. Great, welcome. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, always, uh, it's always great to be able to present research to, uh, to the NSSC and to the students here. Uh, I've been working with uh, students through the NSSC for, I guess, since its inception, um, and I, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, okay, so let's see. So they see the slides online, right? Yeah. I don't have to. <laughs> uh, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, a few beta decay uh, projects that we've been working on. Uh, this work is uh, carried out by a collaboration. Um, it's actually experiments that take place at Argonne National Lab, taking advantage of their accelerator facility, and they have a um, a fission product facility that, that uses a one Curie Californium 252 spontaneous fission source to produce fission products that then, they then thermalize and mass separate into uh, high quality beams. So the work takes place at Argonne National Lab, um, but the, the team that carries out this work is, is shown here on the slide. Uh, there's two national labs involved, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, the Argonne National Lab, um, and a, a large number of I didn't switch over the slide. <laughs> and a large number of, um, of universities. Uh, let's see, I highlighted in red are the graduate students that have been involved in, in various aspects of this work. Um, and what's going to be presented over the course of the next um, uh, 50 minutes is the thesis work of several of these grad students. Uh, uh, Aga Suzumska from, from Berkeley, uh, as well as Ryan Yi. Uh, who graduated, um, uh, I guess, three years prior um, from UC Berkeley. Uh, the, uh, Shane Caldwell from the uh, University of Chicago. Uh, who else am I? And uh, a lot of the work is also being done by Kevin Siegel, who's currently a grad student at the uh, University of Notre Dame. That's what was on the slide. <laughs> uh, okay, so. So I find beta decay extremely interesting. Um, so I, let me, I have just a slide here that goes over some of the basics. Uh, there's a little cartoon here that shows, you know, sort of a very basic explanation of what beta decay is. It's when uh, a, uh, so beta minus decay, for example, is when a, uh, a neutron with a nucleus uh, transforms into a proton and in the process emits a beta particle, beta minus particle, and an antineutrino. Uh, the beta minus particle is just an electron, but we call it a beta particle to, to identify that it came from the nucleus. Um, of course, there's uh, sort of a, there's another very closely related process, beta plus decay, where you have, uh, instead of a neutron becoming a proton, you have a proton becoming a neutron. It emits a positron and a neutrino, uh, and you can have electron capture decays where uh, the proton within the nucleus captures uh, an orbital atomic electron, uh, transforms into a neutron, and in the process emits a neutrino. Uh, in, in beta minus decay, the, the outgoing light particles, the, uh, the electron and the antineutrino, share the, av the available decay energy, uh, and so you get uh, the, the energy spectrum of the beta particle is shown here on the right, um, and it's a continuum, essentially. It extends from the, the maximum decay energy down to, to zero. Um, 
if you look at the uh, the chart of nuclides and you sort all of the known isotopes uh, according to how they decay, uh, you can see here that uh, in magenta are the beta plus decays, in uh, this light blue color are the beta minus decays, uh, and they actually, the, the vast majority of radioactive isotopes decay through one of these processes. Um, and in fact, most of what's not known uh, are the neutron rich isotopes. Um, and so a lot of what's yet to be discovered uh, are isotopes that will also beta decay. So it, it's by far the most common nuclear decay mode. Um, and therefore, perhaps not surprisingly, it impacts many different fields, both basic science and, and applied nuclear science. Uh, in terms of basic science, you can learn quite a bit about uh, how the weak interaction behaves, how the, the interaction that basically causes beta decay to occur, uh, uh, what the properties of that, that interaction are. Um, uh, beta decay can provide lots of neutrinos uh, beta decay provides neutrinos, and in, uh, in a reactor, you have many, many fission products made. Those fission products beta decay. Those fission products all appear here on the nuclear uh, chart. Um, and so it, the a reactor uh, provides the, the largest flux of man-made neutrinos, and so there's a lot of interest in studying those neutrinos uh, to understand if there are, is an exotic uh, sterile neutrino, um, and other properties of, of neutrino oscillations. Uh, in terms of nuclear astrophysics, uh, beta decay is also key in the buildup of the uh, elements heavier than iron. And I'll go into that in the slide. Uh, beta decay also provides some access to um, excited states of, of neutron rich, of, of radioactive nuclei, uh, and therefore gives you a glimpse into the, the structure of those those uh, isotopes. Um, and of course, uh, as I mentioned, all the fission products, beta decay back to stability, by, um, and, uh, and that decay process actually turns out to be really important for the control and operation of nuclear reactors. Uh, okay, so, so, so with beta decay, one of the things we're interested in studying is the standard model, standard model of particle physics. Uh, this is a it's been a very successful um, uh, theory, basically, that describes three of the, uh, the, the fundamental interactions, the electromagnet, electromagnetism, which is mediated by the photon, uh, the strong nuclear force, which holds the nucleus together, which is uh, mediated by the gluon, uh, and the weak nuclear force, which uh, leads to certain types of radioactive decays, like beta decay, uh, which is mediated by the W and Z bosons. Um, and the standard model also uh, basically uh, <clears throat> classifies all the, uh, all the matter that we see in terms of quarks and leptons here, uh, with quarks interacting through the, uh, the, the strong interaction uh, and the electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction. Uh, with the first generation of quarks, the up and down being responsible for produce, for grouping together and making the proton and the neutron. Uh, the, the leptons here don't interact by the, uh, the strong interaction, uh, and the electron, of course, interacts through the electromagnetic interaction, the weak interaction, whereas the neutrino is only the, the weak interaction. <clears throat> um, the, the standard model encompasses a lot uh, and it actually explains uh, essentially all the particle inter the vast majority of particle interactions that we've observed up to, up to now, but it's, uh, it's clearly incomplete. And we know that because it doesn't explain, for example, why we see matter around us and not an equal amount of antimatter out there somewhere. So there, it can't explain this asymmetry. Uh, it also doesn't explain what is, what is dark matter and dark energy. We know that the, the matter shown here accounts for only about 5% of what's out there in the universe. Uh, it also doesn't have a, a you know, really an explanation for why you have this pattern of, of for example, the, the masses of the particles, why the neutrinos are so light, and why the top quark uh, is so heavy. And it doesn't incorporate gravity. I see that 
and also is clearly a, a limitation. Um, so with beta decay, we, if we study beta decay very precisely, we get access to uh, essentially the interaction of this first generation of uh, quarks and leptons uh, with the charged W boson. Um, and here's a, a little cartoon of that shown here. Uh, we have the neutron, which is made up of two uh, down quarks and one up quark. And that down quark transforms into an up quark by way of uh, a W boson uh, emitting a, a beta minus and an anti neutrino. Um, so we can we can probe this this weak process uh, as well as search to see if there's something beyond that. <clears throat> uh, okay. It also, beta decay is also important for understanding the, the synthesis of the elements uh, heavier than iron. Uh, these are made, so once you get to something like iron, the uh, Coulomb repulsion of that iron nucleus with any light charged ions uh, makes it harder to build heavier elements through that kind of fusion process. Uh, so instead, what has to happen is you, you build elements through uh, adding neutrons. Uh, to make heavier and heavier isotopes. And ultimately, beta decay is the process that would transform this excess of neutrons into protons. Uh, and this happens through two ways. One is the, the S process. Uh, th well, this happens in astrophysical environments. The S process uh, occurs in asymptotic giant branch stars. Uh, and it's a slow process that um, proceeds essentially along the line of stability uh, along stable isotopes or long-lived isotopes. Um, the, the R process um, is responsible for about half of these heavy elements, <clears throat> um, and it occurs in a, a very neutron-rich uh, environment, uh, and there's some sort of question about what that environment is, uh, but, but it proceeds along, very, along a path that uh, goes along very neutron-rich isotopes. These are now, I don't know, 10, 20, uh, nucleons off stability, uh, and these are short-lived exotic isotopes. And as the, the flux or uh, the availability of all these neutrons kind of dies away, uh, these short-lived isotopes decay back to stability. Uh, and the beta decay process uh, dictates what stable isotopes you see as a result of what was ultimately produced along the path. Um, and this is this is due to beta late neutron emission, where certain uh, certain uh, now, these exotic isotopes have enough decay energy that as they beta decay, they can also spit out a neutron. And that, of course, changes the, essentially the mass flow as you go back to stability. <clears throat> so for the R process, there is a number of, of open questions about it. One is, uh, what exactly is the astrophysical site? Um, and the other is that this process involves a large number of very exotic nuclei. Uh, and the, it turns out the nuclear properties, things like the binding energies of the nucleons, the beta decay properties, uh, actually matter um, for, for interpreting this, this process. Uh, and the, the thing I mentioned here was uh, the beta delayed neutron emission probability. So this little PN uh, is the fraction of times that you beta decay and emit a neutron. Uh, and it, it influences what you would see. So the black points on this curve here are the, the observed abundances of the different uh, different isotopes here, uh, shown uh, sorted according to mass here. And there's two different models, one shown without beta delayed neutron emission at all, and that's in blue, and the other shows the impact of uh, predicted values for these beta delayed. Uh, neutron emission properties. You can see there's quite a big difference there. So it's, it's important to, to get that right. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I'll be talking about is uh, we have a new way to, to determine that, that probability of neutron emission, that, that neutron emission branching ratio. Um, also, uh, so for, for um, applications, uh, beta decay is really plays a central uh, role in controlling the nuclear reactor. Right, so these, these the beta delayed neutrons I mentioned are emitted on the time scale of the beta decay. And the, the ones that emit neutrons tend to have half lives that are sort of on time scales of tens or hundreds of milliseconds up to a few minutes. Uh, and they contribute an additional 1% of the total neutrons that you get in, in a reactor, right? Obviously, most of them are from fission. 
but this beta decay process gives you an additional 1%. Um, and that turns out to be very important to allow mechanical control of the chain reaction that's going on within the reactor. Um, because if you run the, the reactor, it's just a slightly subcritical um, state so that the, uh, the beta delayed neutron, the beta delayed neutrons are required uh, for it to reach critical. You can then control that, you can sort of stabilize it um, using mechanical control and adjust things on the time scale of the beta delayed neutron emission, which is you know, seconds to minutes. Uh, you don't have to do it on a much faster time scale of the fission uh, neutrons. <clears throat> um, and so there's a lot of interest in getting the understanding the, the number of these neutrons and the energy spectra, and they vary a bit depending on the different fuels used. Uh, and you'd like to have you know, as complete knowledge of that as possible. It gives you a lot of flexibility for modeling the reactor performance under uh, a variety of different conditions. <clears throat> Okay, so, uh, so one of the issues is that uh, beta decay studies uh, are, can be quite challenging. Uh, and the reason for this is that the two particles that are emitted from the nucleus uh, are not so easy to, to study in great detail. Um, of course, I think we all know that the neutrino uh, is extremely difficult to study. It, you know, if you want to detect an individual neutrino from a decay, uh, our biggest and sort of most effective detector for that would be uh, something like Super Kamiokanda. It's a 50 kiloton water shrink off detector. Uh, and even that has an extremely low detection efficiency for an individual neutrino, something like 10 to the minus 15 or less. Um, so that's quite difficult unless you have a very large number of neutrinos. Um, Low energy beta particle spectroscopy, although obviously nowhere near as difficult as the neutrino spectroscopy, um, but it, it also has its challenges. Uh, one is that the, the beta particle has a continuum, uh, the energy spectrum is continuous. Um, so it kind of looks like a background, it kind of looks like every other beta spectrum. So uh, you can, the beta particle is a charged particle, so if as it emerges from the source, it loses energy. As it goes through detector dead layers, it loses energy. Um, and so it's hard to get that energy you know, precisely measured. Um, and it's also a light particle, so it scatters around your apparatus and it uh, loses energy through Bremsschlung photon emission. Um, and that also needs to be taken into account. Uh, and so this is a difficult game, but uh, I'm gonna argue that with new techniques, such as ion traps that I'll present uh, and the, the radioactive beam facilities that are coming online, uh, as well as you know, nice uh, sophisticated detector systems, we can make a lot of progress understanding this decay mode. So to this end, we developed a device called the beta decay fall trap, we call the BPT, uh, to do very precise studies of beta decay. The idea here is that uh, this device uses just electric fields to suspend uh, radioactive ions in a small volume, something like a cubic millimeter. They're suspended just in vacuum using the electric fields uh, at pretty low energy, and you hold them there until they beta decay. And the new thing that this gets you is that uh, you're able to get access to the nuclear recoil. So the, the Nucleus emits a beta particle and a neutrino. The nucleus recoils from that. Uh, often, because the nucleus is so much heavier than the beta and the neutrino, that recoil energy is quite low. Uh, it can be as, as it's a continuum that extends down to zero, um, but it's often of order, you know, 100 eV, 100 electron volts or so. And so that information is almost always lost unless you're holding the, the, the isotopes in vacuum. Uh, and so the great thing this does for you is it gives you some new opportunities to study both the neutrinos and the neutrons emitted in beta decay. So for neutrino spectroscopy, for example, if you measure the beta particle that's emitted and you can determine what the size of that nuclear recoil, you can then event by event reconstruct what the neutrino energy and momentum had to have been. And for neutron spectroscopy, uh, the, the fact that the neutron um, carries away you know, uh, something like 1% of the, the mass of, of the nucleus you know, for something, for a nucleus that has 100 uh, nucleons, for example, 
the, the kick that the nucleus gets from the neutron emission step is much larger than the kick it gets from the emission of the beta and the neutrino. So you can approximate this as just a two-body uh, process where the neutron goes one way and the nucleus has an equal and opposite uh, momentum from that. So again, if you can measure the size of that nuclear recoil, you can then, to a good approximation, reconstruct the neutron energy. Um, and the trap has a lot of other nice properties, which I'll go into in the next slides. Um, one of which being that you can very efficiently load it with rare nuclei, which is important when you're you know, producing very few of these at a, uh, at a uh, accelerator facility. Uh, here's the, some photos of what the device looks like. Um, to give you a sense of scale, it's about the size of a shoebox, maybe 30 centimeters on the side here. Um, and the, the, the electrode plates are, are shown as uh, basically a set of, of plates that uh, point in towards the middle of the device. On the right is a bit of a cartoon, which is a cross-section through, uh, through the center of that device. Uh, the electric, the, the voltages are applied on these plates, um, and there's a large amount of, of uh, area uh, where you can stick radiation detectors. And what's, what's shown in this graphic here are four different uh, double-sided silicon strip detectors um, that are used to surround the ions, which would sit at the center of that device. Um, and we can we can load this thing with about uh, about a hundred thousand ions in it at once. Uh, if you try to put more in it, the, the the charge of the ions themselves start to to um, make it more difficult to put more inside of it. Uh, this device we've used with a whole bunch of different radiation detectors. We've used microchannel plate detectors for low energy ion detection. We've used remaining detectors to detect gamma rays that are emitted from these radioactive isotopes uh, and plastic simulator detectors um, for the beta particle spectroscopy and double-sided silicon strip detectors for both beta and alpha spectroscopy. Um, oops. So it, the next two slides, I have just a, a little cartoon of how this device combines ions. Uh, I think it's, it's informative to, to get an idea of that. Uh, those plates that were shown before and are now depicted as circles here, these are the electrodes where the voltage is applied uh, with these time-dependent voltages that are shown there. Um, so what you get is uh, an electric field that's zero in the center, essentially at all times due to symmetry, uh, and the, the potential increases quadratically away from the center, and so the, the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field increases linearly as you move away from the center. So if you have an ion that starts close to one of the electrodes at a point in time, it sees um, a, quite a large electric field that's pushing it towards the center of the device. And so it responds to that by moving towards the center where the electric field is now a little bit weaker. Um, and of course, some time has passed as that's happened. Uh, and so the phase of the electric field can shift. Uh, and now instead of pushing it in towards the center, it'll push it away from the center. But because the electric field is smaller there, it gets a smaller kick away from the center. Time passes, these electric fields switch, it gets a slightly bigger kick into the center. And you can imagine that process repeating over and over, where the, the net effect is each time the push into the center is a little bit bigger than the push away from the center. And so your ions, therefore, are attracted to the minimum of this RF uh, electric field here, which is the center. Uh, and there's some stability requirements you have to satisfy to make sure that the, the phase, that the electric field switches at the right, um, uh, with the right frequency um, to make this work out right. Uh, but this has all been worked out and it's, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, we do this with uh, voltages that are typically about somewhere between 100 volts and 1,000 volts and RF frequencies that vary between about 200 kilohertz and about 2 megahertz. Depends on the, you know, so depends somewhat on the mass, the mass of the ion that you're, that you're studying. Uh, along the, uh, so that's in the radial directions, the X and Y directions, that's how we can find it, can find the ions. In the third direction, uh, we do something a little simpler, which makes it easier for us to load the ions. We just use a DC electrostatic potential shown like this. 
Uh, the ions come in at a, a particular time. Uh, they see this electrostatic potential wall, um, and so they get reflected from it. But before they can leave the vicinity of the trap region, we then adjust the voltages on the device, and we, we increase one of the, uh, the potentials to confine the ions. Uh, the ions then rattle around here. We've got a little bit of helium buffer gas in there to cool the ions down, and this happens in less than a second, uh, to, to low energies, where the ions then sit with uh, something like a tenth of an electron volt, uh, and we can hold them there for hundreds of seconds, where basically long enough for them to decay through beta decay. Um, and if we want to accumulate more ions, we now have this cold bunch sitting at the bottom. We can bring in a new bunch, uh, while still retaining the old one, uh, and we repeat that process again, and we can accumulate ions. So we can load a whole bunch in there and hold on to them uh, for much longer than their radioactive half-life. So we do two things, or at least what I'm going to explain today is we do two things with this device. One is neutrino spectroscopy. So these are tests of the standard model by looking at the, uh, the neutrinos emitted uh, and this is work that was highlighted uh, on the DOE Office of Science website uh, back in August. Um, and so the, the, the link is shown there if you want to, I guess, read about it in this, this article. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about this in the next several slides. Um, so originally back in the 1960s, it was, it was detailed studies of beta decay that were used to get the first understanding of the, of the weak interaction. Uh, and so, <clears throat> uh, and people did this by essentially studying the, uh, the, the angular correlation between the beta and the neutrino particle. And that would tell you what kind of interaction there was occurring between uh, when a proton transformed into the neutron and emitted these two particles. <clears throat> uh, okay. There's four, four different possibilities for this. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the neutrino spectroscopy is, is essentially impossible. So the way people did it was to measure the nuclear recoil. Uh, and what they had access to at the time was if you had a, a noble gas that underwent beta decay, again, you had, uh, you had basically a gas. Um, and so you had access to that nuclear recoil. And so you could study systems like helium-6 or neon beta decays. Uh, and what you're looking for is uh, an angular correlation between these particles. Uh, it's, it's actually the, this little coefficient here, this, this little a here. And the size of that actually tells you what type of interaction uh, is, is carrying out this process. Um, there's different types of beta decay. There's uh, gamma teller beta decay, which would be on the, the leftmost axis here, where the, the spins of the two, the beta and the neutrino, line up. Uh, and then there's a Fermi transition, which would be on the other extreme, where the two are anti-aligned. Uh, and depending on the initial and final spins of the parent and daughter nucleus, you can have either a pure gamma teller on the left, a pure Fermi decay on the right, or some combination of the two. <clears throat> um, but the, the size of this, um, this little a coefficient determines basically how large the nuclear recoil is. Right? If this takes on a positive value, then the, uh, the beta particle, the neutrino, tend to be tend to be emitted in the same along the same direction or similar directions, and therefore the nucleus gets a larger recoil from that. And if this takes on a negative value, they tend to be emitted in opposite directions, and the recoil is therefore smaller. Uh, so these measurements were done in the 1960s. The results are shown here in red. Uh, and you can see they agreed quite nicely with uh, one pair of these interactions. Right? There, there were four potential pairs here, uh, and they agreed very nicely with the V minus A interaction. And so you could eliminate, essentially, the others. Um, we now, we now know a lot more about this process. Uh, we know it's mediated by the W boson. We know things like its mass, the coupling constants, and so on. Um, but it's still an open question if, if that's the entire story. Maybe if we study this process closely enough, we'll see that there is an additional process coming in that contributes 
other coupling constants here that slightly distort the results uh, it's provide results that are slightly different from just the pure V minus A interaction. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, in terms of uh, looking for a, I guess if I go back, in terms of looking for just a pure tensor interaction, this term here, the, the most sensitive searches are done with a pure gamma of Teller decay, as you've shown here. And in terms of, if for beta decay, that, that precision, the best, most precise measurement um, dates back to 1963, where they measured the, the energy spectrum of the recoiling lithium ions. And that's, that's shown here. Um, and the, the distribution of those, re, the, the distribution of the energy of those recoiling lithium ions tells you uh, what that little a coefficient is. And that's where we get, at least from beta decay, the, the most detailed information about uh, if there's a tensor contribution. There's a lot of interest in improving upon that with sort of modern techniques and technology. And there's some experiments that are ongoing to do a more detailed look at the decay of helium-6. And what I want to talk to you about is uh, we want to get at the same physics using our device and studying what we believe to be our better, better suited isotopes for this kind of work. Um, the lithium-8 decay or the or boron-8 decay. Uh, and we now have access to these um, because we can hold them in ion traps. Uh, so these, these decays actually are quite nice for this kind of uh, beta decay work. If you look at the decay of lithium-8, it decays to an excited state of beryllium-8, which uh, immediately breaks up into two alpha particles. And it decays with a, an enormous amount of energy, at least in the standards of beta decay. So you have about 16 MeV of energy, and that's shared um, well, that's, that means that the, uh, the nuclear recoil is quite large, um, not only because the Q value is large, but also the, the ion is quite light to begin with. Uh, and so the, the recoil energy is large. Um, and what you end up measuring is the beta particle as well as these two alpha particles. And so you're measuring particles that all have MeV energies, and we have a lot of radiation detectors that are well suited for that. And the, the recoil then imparts uh, a very large kinematic shift on those alpha particles. So they, they would ordinarily, in the center of mass frame, they'd have about one and a half MeV of energy each. But in the lab frame, due to that nucleus, the nuclear recoil, the shifts are about 400 keV. So these are enormous effects. I think earlier I mentioned the recoil energies are typically 100 electron volts or so. Um, and so this is a much, uh, much larger effect we're looking for. Uh, also, there's some nice symmetry in this process. In the end, what we're looking for is the energy difference of the two alpha particles, um, and that, that encodes the information about the size of the nuclear recoil. And so there's symmetry that we've kind of built into the experiment with the detector array, and there's a nice symmetry in the decay itself, where you're looking at two different, the energy of two nearly uh, similar energy alpha particles. And if we measure the beta particle and the two alpha particles, that's enough information for us to fully reconstruct the decay, uh, including the neutrino. <clears throat> so with our detector array, which is, uh, we're just, I guess I'll go back. There's four silicon detectors that surround the, uh, the radioactive ions. So these measure the energy of the alpha particle, and they're segmented, so we also know the position of where the hit occurs. And from that, we can reconstruct, well, first we can reconstruct the, uh, the position and extent of the ion cloud uh, by looking at the back-to-back -back alpha particles. So we can measure things like uh, the cooling process, right? When we first put the ions in, they're kind of warm and they, they uh, span a large volume. Um, and over the process of about 20 milliseconds, the, they interact with the helium buffer gas and they cool down. So we can study in great detail. Uh, and by looking at, and that gives us confidence that we um, are, are holding the ions well and we know where they are. Uh, and then we can look at the energy difference of the two alpha particles to understand the size of the nuclear recoil. Uh, so for example, if we look at beta particles here, 
that are in, that are going nearly parallel to one of the alpha particles. What we expect is if the beta particle goes one way, the, the nuclear recoil is on average going to be in the opposite direction. And for alpha particles that are going parallel to the beta particle, the one, so in this case alpha two, that's going along the direction of the nuclear recoil will be seen with a higher energy, and alpha one will be seen with a lower energy, just due to the kinematics here. And for the standard model interaction, we anticipate that the nuclear recoils are going to be on the small side because the beta and the neutrino tend to go in opposite directions. And therefore, this energy difference between the two alpha particles will also be closer to zero. Uh, if, if instead there's a tensor interaction, the beta and the neutrino tend to go in the same direction, the recoil is larger, and the energy difference between the alpha particles is larger. Um, and that, when you work it out, based on all the kinematics, uh, you get a plot like this, which has both the, the, the line shape you expect for a tensor interaction shown in gray, and the line shape you expect for an axial vector standard model interaction in black. Uh, and the data is shown there as a histogram, and as you can see, it agrees quite nicely with, uh, with the standard model prediction. And in fact, we can put a quite a strong limit on the absence of any of this tenor, tensor interaction uh, that's shown at the bottom here. Uh, and so this is a, a fairly stringent um, limit. In fact, it's uh, the first improvement on this type of limit in, in about half a century from beta decay. <laughs> so this probably is a little more detailed than is necessary here, but we are continuing to push the precision of this type of work. Um, so one of our graduate students, it's her PhD thesis to uh, make this search even more sensitive. We think we can improve it by about a factor of three. We already have the data collected for this, about 10 times higher statistics. And um, I'm not, I'm not I'm gonna kind of skip through this, but we have a handle on the major, the, the dominating systematic effects um, essentially by upgrading our system. Uh, and so what we anticipate we can do is we can reduce this uncertainty by about a factor of three, both by improving the statistics and by addressing a number of these systematic effects. So this, you know, this is already a very interesting result, and I think uh, with a factor of three improvement, it's going to provide really uh, interesting competitive uh, limits on the tensor interaction. So the, the other thing we do with this device is do beta delayed neutron spectroscopy. Uh, so some of this work was featured a few years ago in uh, science and technology review at the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Got some sort of nice um, fancy uh, images of the device. Uh, and I, I put the link up there uh, for that article. <clears throat> what we're studying here is uh, beta delayed neutron emission. Uh, if you take, let's say you consider an element like iodine, um, the, the stable isotope is iodine-127. As you add neutrons to it, um, it becomes unstable uh, and it can decay through, by beta decay to either the ground state of the daughter, uh, in this case xenon-131, or several low-lying uh, excited states that are accessible, that are energetically accessible, that de-excite through gamma ray emission. As you keep adding neutrons to it, as you make the, this element more and more uh, neutron rich, and several things happen. The, the radioactive half-life decreases uh, and the Q value increases. And at some point that Q value becomes larger than the, uh, the separation energy or essentially the binding energy of the neutron in the daughter nucleus. And when that happens, you have a new decay mode that opens up and it's called beta-delayed neutron emission. Uh, again, you can have decays to the ground state, and you can have decays to excited states that de-excite by gamma emission. Um, but now, if you decay up to some of these states, uh, you're likely to decay through by beta delayed neutron emission. Because up here, the strong interaction is going to sort of rapidly overtake the uh, electromagnetic interaction, and so most of these excited states are going to de-excite through neutron emission. 
Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is this process, although it seems like it's uh, sort of an exotic process, it's important for understanding how heavy elements are produced uh, in, in astrophysical environments. It's uh, great interest for understanding nuclear structure properties for neutron rich isotopes um, and for, for reactor design and performance, it's, it's important. Uh, if you look at on the right, what I've shown are the uh, sort of a, a little uh, segment of the uh, chart of the nuclides, which shows the different fission products. Um, uh, so the black squares here are the stable isotopes, the red are all the fission products uh, that are produced with a um, I don't remember what the cutoff is, but there's a certain uh, a yield cutoff on this on this plot. If you look at the ones where this beta delay neutron emission process is energetically allowed, it's uh, highlighted in green, so it's about a quarter or a third of the total, obviously on the, the more neutron rich side. And then if you look at the cases where sort of the most basic property, which is how many of these neutrons are emitted in beta decay, uh, if you look at which fraction of those isotopes, you have a measure of that branching ratio that has a fractional precision of 10% or better. Those are the ones highlighted in, in blue. So there's not very many of them. There's, there's a considerable amount of room for improvement here. Um, and if you're then interested in things like the energy spectrum of those neutrons, uh, there's only five or 10 of those measurements um, where, where the energy spectrum is measured at all. And those measurements, uh, in many cases, are sort of questionable quality, I would say. Uh, so we have a new way to, to measure the beta delayed neutron emission uh, to get the number of neutrons that are emitted, as well as the energy spectrum of those neutrons. Um, and that's, again, using this device. Uh, we can sidestep all the challenges with associated with direct neutron detection. Uh, you know, ne neutrons are neutral particles, so they they pass through detector material, they scatter on all sorts of, on, you know, different parts of your apparatus. Uh, they're just, they're, they're not easy to, um, to study in great detail or with great precision. Uh, so we do something a little different here. Uh, so again, here's the, uh, the cross-sectional view of the ion trap device with the electrodes shown as these diagonal plates. Uh, and now a detector array that includes classic scintillator detectors that we'll use for beta detection, uh, microchannel plate detectors that we're going to use to detect low energy recoiling nuclei, and germanium detectors for gamma ray detection. So the idea here is um, if we detect the beta particle in coincidence with the, uh, the recoiling nucleus, we can, we can uh, distinguish beta decay that leads just beta decay on its own from beta delayed neutron emission. And the way we can do that is if you look at beta decay, let's say a nucleus emits a, a 1 MeV beta particle, the nuclear recoil is going to be quite small. Uh, I've assumed a 100 nucleon nucleus for this, um, but you get the idea. The, the, the recoil energy is quite small. It's 10 electron volts in this case. Uh, if instead you emit a 1 MeV neutron, uh, the, the recoil from that is quite a bit larger. It's 10 keV, a thousand times larger in this case. Um, and so you can identify the fact that a neutron was emitted by looking at that much larger, by observing that much larger nuclear recoil. And the way we get access to the size of the nuclear recoil is from the time of flight. Right? The higher energy recoils have larger velocity and they'll reach our detector much more rapidly. Uh, the beta particle, of course, travels nearly the speed of light, so that makes it to our detector on the nanosecond time scale. Um, and we can tell that, so we can get the energy spectrum based on the, uh, the distribution of the time of flights, and we can tell how many or what fraction of the time we emitted a neutron by counting the total number of beta particles and comparing it to the number of coincidences we see, or we have other measures, which is you can look at the total number of uh, the, the ions that arrive at late times and compare them to the ions that arrive at short times. Um, or we can, we can also tell the total number of decays that occur by looking at the gamma ray emission as well. So we, we ran this experiment um, 
a few years ago. Uh, and we looked at the, this is now the time of flight distribution of those uh, recoiling ions, uh, where the zero time of flight is here. And that's, that's things like beta particle scattering or beta gamma scattering, uh, triggering both detectors nearly, nearly simultaneously. Um, but for the recoil ions, you see that they um, sort of uh, fall into two different uh, time of flight peaks. At longer times of flight, something like four microseconds or longer, but those are the ions where the, the beta decay either went to the ground state or some state that emitted gamma rays. And this, this little window here, which is about um, 400 nanoseconds to about two microseconds is when a neutron is emitted. Um, so at the time, the, the quality of the data wasn't great. Uh, we had a very small detector array and we were working with very weak beams. Uh, and our, our data rate was about one beta neutron recoil coincidence per hour. So it was patient work at the time. But from that, we collected this spectrum. We can convert the time of flight spectrum of the recoiling ion, uh, which is shown on the right here, to determine the, the energy of the nuclear recoil. And from the energy of the nuclear recoil, we can back out the energy of the neutron. And that, that's shown here. Uh, when we do that, we get the data shown in red, um, and that's compared to, in blue, uh, direct measurement of the neutron energy spectrum that was made with helium-3 tubes, uh, and we've, we've then uh, convoluted that, that other measurement with our detector resolution um, to make a, sort of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So this was very encouraging to us. Uh, that uh, even, even with a very weak beam and this, this very uh, modest detector array, we could get results that make sense. And we looked at the branching ratio as well, uh, and we got results here that are somewhere between 6.8% and about 7%. Uh, and those agree quite nicely with um, basically the world average data on this, which is about 7.3%. So this isotope was chosen because it's been very well studied. Uh, it's produced abundantly in fission. Uh, we had easy access to it. Uh, since that work, um, we upgraded the detector array. Um, we got just a, a more detectors and, and larger ones that were better suited for this work. The facility upgraded their ion beam. Um, so, we had, so the data came in quite a bit higher, now something like 100 uh, coincidences an hour. Uh, and so we can collect data that looks a lot more promising, <laughs> something shown here. Uh, and again, when you, when you zoom in on this little peak here at uh, about half a microsecond, those are the, the recoils where a neutron, those are the, the nuclei that are recoiling from neutron emission. And you do that same process, uh, and you get the blue data shown here. That's our work there. Uh, and it compares quite nicely, again, with the direct measurements that are shown in gray. Uh, we do below a certain energy, um, it's grayed out here, and what's happening is the nuclear, the, the recoil the nucleus gets from the neutron is so low that uh, it becomes indistinguishable from the recoil you get from, from just ordinary beta decay. And so at that point, we can no longer distinguish the two processes, uh, and you can see the, the data skyrockets. Um, and so we, we really don't have any sensitivity to neutrons below uh, about 75 keV. <clears throat> so we, we studied a number of isotopes like that. The, the ones we studied are, are shown here. They're um, antimony isotopes, some iodine isotopes, and some cesium isotopes. Uh, and you can see this, you know, a similar pattern in each case. You have the a big peak due to the ions where you go to the ground state or a gamma emitting state. Uh, and you have a, a smaller peak at shorter times of flight, which are due to the neutron emission. Um, and there was another isotope, antimony-134, which uh, doesn't emit neutrons, but it actually has a very simple, uh, or we anticipated it to have a very simple decay pattern. And uh, we use that to, to basically calibrate our apparatus to understand how well our simulations are agreeing. Um, with the data, uh, and so this is, ends up being a very important calibration for us. Uh, yeah, so I put up a few other spectra. 
Um, these are the cases where we can compare to previously measured results. Um, and our, our data in blue, again, agrees quite favorably uh, with what's out there in the literature. Um, in the other cases, our measurements will be the first. Uh, for the other isotopes, our measurements will be the first uh, measurements of the neutron energy spectra. Um, so the branching ratio, so the, the fraction of times you emit a neutron can be determined uh, three different ways. One is, uh, so in each case, you have to use the number of those ions that arrive at short times of flight. And in uh, one way we can determine the, the fraction of neutrons emitted is by comparing the, that number of ions, those, those fastest recoil ions, just to the total number of beta decays we observe. Um, we can also compare it to the number of um, beta gamma coincidences we see. Uh, this has the advantage that um, you're insensitive to any contaminants that may be in the trap. So that gamma ray that you detect uh, provides a clean sig signature of the decay of interest. Uh, but you need additional nuclear data there to get a branching ratio. Uh, and the new thing that we can do is compare those fastest ions to the slower ions. Uh, take a ratio there and determine the, the number uh, of neutrons that are emitted. So we have three ways to go about doing this. Uh, and so when we compare what we get, which are the, the second through fourth points here on each of these uh, plots, uh, our results again agree quite nicely with what's out there in the literature. Um, in the case of iodine, well, in all these cases, what's shown is a world average. So it's a um, these error bars are quite small because it's taking into account many different measurements um, and, and averaging them together. Uh, but in, in each of our cases, the, the different ways that we determine the branching ratio is consistent with what's uh, is consistent with one another, and in each of these cases, agrees nicely with um, with what's uh, what's what had been previously known about them. Uh, so we want to go forward and uh, study more exotic nuclei with this. Uh, and th this is, these are our plans. We, we, what we'd like to do is develop a, a, a new ion trap system that's really fully optimized for this work. The, what we had done was we had taken the, the ion trap system was originally designed for the neutrino spectroscopy work. It had been adapted for this uh, neutron, these neutron studies, uh, but it's not well, right now we have the one apparatus that's doing double duty and has to be moved back and forth. Um, and so that's painful, uh, but also we can develop a sort of an optimized system for this beta delayed neutron work. Uh, we can get a, a detector system that's quite a bit more efficient and the yields at that um, fission product facility are even greater today than they were a few years ago when we did this. Um, so we think we can collect even you know, something like 100 times um, uh, more data than we had before. That would allow us to push out quite a bit further uh, to try to get closer to the R process path. Um, and it would also allow us to do really detailed studies of the fission products that are produced at the peaks, uh, which would be interesting for applications. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Uh, so I just want to summarize by saying that uh, you know, we've developed this new ion trap system um, and it allows us to get access to the nuclear recoil following beta decay. Uh, and that new information is something that we hadn't had before and it allows us to do neutrino spectroscopy uh, as well as neutron spectroscopy uh, without having to detect either the neutrino or the neutron. Uh, you know, we're, we're pursuing the, these measurements to address a lot of different topics in basic and applied nuclear science. Uh, and we think that we're poised well to, to um, take advantage of the increased beam intensities of these radioactive beam facilities to develop a new apparatus and make uh, even higher precision measurements. Um, and certainly this may not be all the things you can do with it. There may be a, a, you know, other clever ideas that you can think of that would take advantage of this nuclear recoil. Like I said, this is, this is information we hadn't had access to previously. Um, and then I'll just put up a little advertisement. We're looking, uh, 
for graduate students to join to join us in this this work at Livermore. Um, in the past in the past several years, uh, I've had the great pleasure to work with a number of uh, PhD students as part of our collaboration with the NSOC. Uh, listed their names and their their PhD uh, the PhDs they got. Uh, in many cases, they got um, fellowships through Livermore itself, or uh, in, the case of, in the case of Barbara Wang, she had a Department of Homeland Security fellowship. Um, but these make really great um, grad student projects um, with pretty good visibility within the lab and the broader scientific community. So hopefully somebody is interested in this. Uh, we would really enjoy Working with the uh, working with this, the NSSC students. Okay. Are there any questions? 